even if one is the most sinful of all sinners. One shall yet cross over the ocean of sin by the raft of self-knowledge alone. As the blazing fire reduces wood to ashes, similarly the fire of self-knowledge reduces all bonds of karma to ashes. Hello everyone and welcome to episode 8 in this series on awakening the chakras. The episode after this will be the last episode in this series where we will sort of look at some concluding information, look at some more aspects and practices that I couldn't include in the other episodes and just answer some common questions as well. After that, I'll also be doing a live public Q&A on YouTube to have a sort of friendly chat with you all and answer even more questions and a kind of thank you to everyone for the support and kind comments and the surprising success of this series. Uh, but in the meantime, we'll now cover the last chakra. And as you've probably guessed by now, it is the most superior and elevated chakra out of our whole energetic body, the crown chakra, Sahasrara, located in the pineal gland with its energy covering the entire top part of the head. The pineal gland is also known as the most superior gland in the body in terms of biology, which has a lot to do with the sexual organs, secretion of hormones into the blood, into the fluid in the brain, into the cerebrospinal fluid, and many other parts, such as also regulating the adrenal glands and the thyroid. The element of the crown chakra is spirit, consciousness, with the pineal gland being the seat of the soul which governs and affects the entire nervous system. If you've ever felt the head of a newborn baby, you'll know how soft it is if you've felt the crown before. This is because the soul of that person is still slowly integrating into their new physical vehicle. Also note how the pineal gland looks like a pine cone. The word pine cone in Latin is literally pinea, hence it led to the name pineal gland. This chakra is the lotus flower of a thousand petals, the crown or halo of the saints, and our connection to the spiritual heavens. So when the energy or the primal energies that are down below are raised, purified, transmuted above, that's when we get that glow, that halo in the head that we see amongst depicted so many uh, spiritual masters. Now, of course, the pineal gland has been referred to as the third eye as well, sometimes too. And for good reason, because you see the crown chakra or the pineal gland is essentially an eye of itself, but a superior one, as we'll see. It's also known as the diamond eye or the window of Brahma. Now you may recall that in the Root Chakra episode, the Root Chakra is where life force enters our system, giving energy to the physical body and also spiritual things. And generally, as long as you're alive, you have at least some prana being generated there. So if there's any chakra that's at least already open in everyone, it's the Root Chakra. Now. Just as the root chakra absorbs energy from below, the crown chakra is similar to the root chakra in the sense that it also absorbs energy, but from above. And unlike the root chakra, the crown energy center is the chakra that is most likely heavily blocked or closed in most people. It's the most sort of difficult one for the general population to open, especially in those who we would label as quote-unquote closed-minded. 
You see, it's the crown chakra that allows us to see new viewpoints, new perspectives, and also understand them. You see, as we saw in the previous episode, one can have a third eye, but that third eye can be completely focused on only the reality it wants to see, or in other words, what the ego wants to see. So without the connection to the crown chakra, the third eye is very difficult to work with in a real way. You can very much say that it is impossible to open the third eye in an authentic way without the crown chakra. The crown chakra is where we attain a totally different dimension of consciousness. And what happens when we shift our level of consciousness in a fundamental way? Well, then every aspect of our reality changes at a fundamental way inevitably also changing the way of energy in all the other chakras below it. So the crown chakra is where we shift into a totally different mode of understanding and engagement of life. In dramatic examples, we can understand this as when one reaches a profound level of satori, or enlightenment, or bliss, or Samadhi, or Nirvana, or Satchitananda, or Heaven. You know, Heaven being something we carry within. So this is all to do, and it all takes place within the crown chakra, within the blossoming of the thousand petals. It's when one reaches a sudden state of spiritual awakening, self-realization, and they suddenly realize or suddenly see life from a radically different psychological, emotional standpoint because something within us has given way, has surrendered. The dysfunctional mind has surrendered all of its conditioning. Now, this is not a very common experience to have, of course, and even when one does experience something like that, in reality it's only because a small percentage of ego has dissolved. And so it's important for people to not get identified or let their divine experience make them think they've attained the level of Christ or Buddha or something. Far from it. It just means that they've been given a taste of divine consciousness and that they should now sense the responsibility to begin to walk towards the path and deepen it as they continue their life. Now, I'm sure some of you have heard of spiritual awakening and experiences in various forms already, so I won't go too deep into it, and I'm sure some of you have actually had these spontaneous mystical experiences where you understood the oneness and beauty of existence in an extremely eye-opening, life-changing eye-watering way where love pervades every object you look at and reality is a mother's loving embrace instead of a dark, miserable emptiness of conflict to which the modern human mind leans so easily towards. And it is in this endowment, in this flowering of the crown chakra where we are sort of blessed with such profound experiences. This magnetic center within the brain opens with light and when Kundalini reaches this chakra, it activates the 12 cranial nerves in the brain in vibrant harmony, which are also related to the 12 zodiacal principles each one relating to 12 faculties of the human being. Interestingly, above the 12 signs of the zodiac, if we double it, we get 24 laws related to the astral body. If we double 24, we get 48, which are about 48 laws or laws of karma, which govern the physical body. But more on that on another video. 
Now, as we learned about the different ways in which we spiritually sense energies or non-physical dimensions, such as empathy or clairaudience in the throat or clairvoyance in the third eye, well, polyvoyance is the ability of the crown chakra, and it essentially means intuitive clairvoyance, or in other words, divine omniscience. Now, of course, we relate omniscience to when a god or gods know everything, right? But I've been trying to express from the very beginning of this series, spiritual awakening and consciousness is completely multidimensional, multifaceted, multilayered. And so when we begin to gradually awaken to the crown chakra, this is where we begin to develop a gradual intuitive clairvoyance, where we don't just see imagery, but can connect to imagery beyond our limited earthly understanding. And it helps us to sort of connect to higher realms of knowledge and intuition that resonate with our being in the infinite realms of consciousness where all knowledge is stored. Hence the popular topic about the Akashic records, where we can find out about anything we want to find out about. And this is related to the crown chakra and this omniscient type of intuition. And also, of course, it's related to the chakra in the lungs, as we saw in the previous episodes about connecting to this Akashic field. So we can all connect to this field, at least to some degree. For example, sometimes people ask me, uh, what happens when we die? And, you know, I give various answers, not based on science or what another author wrote, but from my own mind. And they say, yeah, but Gene, you can't know that, can you? <laughs> and, well, to a degree, they're correct, because obviously I have not died yet, so I haven't experienced it. I can't know it fully, but through years of spiritual practice, astral projection, and various other practical spiritual investigations, I have a sort of inner sense of the type of phenomena and energies that would arise during the time of death. You know, it's sort of like walking down a long road for many years and eventually you see some blurry silhouettes of mountains in the distance and you can at least vaguely describe them to people. But people who have just been reading about the path and not actually walking it are so behind on the path that they can't see any part of the mountain that I'm describing. They just see an empty horizon while I'm out here saying, no, just, you know, make the effort to come here, follow the directions on your little GPS or whatever, and have a look. You'll see what I mean if you just take a few steps towards it. You know, forget stupid theories and modern sciences and take a step within towards the great beyond where direct knowledge is accessible. And so it is the crown chakra that allows us to move down the path towards the mountains. It budges us out of our fixed point of view and helps us to begin to ride the waves of other views that help us to find our feet on our inner path. So if the crown chakra receives energy like the root chakra, what kind of energy does it absorb and where does it come from? Well, we can understand it like this. Since it's the Divine Mother Kundalini who rises up the spine, it's the Divine Masculine Principle, the Divine Father, which comes from the heavens to meet the Mother in our pineal gland and where they commune. This is the reunion of Shiva and Shakti. 
So in a way, love from the mother comes from below and wisdom from the father comes from above, which in turn creates the Holy Spirit, or in other words, awakened Kundalini. So, you know, it's a good idea not to be too attached or overly fascinated with the aspects of all the other chakras, because the end goal, in a way, is to ascend and transmute these energies to the highest point where they can be healed and integrated and transformed and understood. And that happens in the crown chakra, in the crown centre. Now, in order to understand the negative polar manifestations of the crown chakra, well, since the crown chakra is to do with the most elevated states of spiritual consciousness and enlightenment, well, then think about the opposite of that. Think about the opposite effects of meditation. Or, in other words, think of the people who need meditation the most. And this is where we can understand what a closed or imbalanced crown chakra looks like. It's when we have no connection with spirituality, with our higher self, with our higher states of consciousness, of ourselves and of the world. The ones who need meditation the most are usually people with various mental issues or mental difficulties. These issues can be made worse the longer we neglect finding our spiritual, psychological sense of purpose in this existence to which the crown chakra endows us with. The crown centre helps us find that mental balance. Remember that the mental plane is above the astral plane. And it's our mental faculties that can help heal the rest of our lower system of the astral, the etheric vital body and the physical body as well. So, you know, almost all mental issues can be developed from a lack of spiritual understanding and purpose, you know. With a sense of purpose, we suddenly take a whole different approach to this experience we call life and start to enjoy every moment because we understand how it fits all together in our own awakening. This kind of feeling heals things such as depression, existential crisis, anxiety, stress, etc. because we begin to understand the harmony of our own life and how everything fits together as it should, even the so-called negative parts. So the crown chakra is where deeper mental meditation takes place. And you know, meditation is not about escaping from the world, from its problems, but confronting reality directly and to see it exactly for the way it is, rather than the way we think it to be, rather than the way our ego translates or interprets it to be. Deep meditation is about engaging with reality in a more real way, not escaping. Escaping is ignorance, you know? The word ignorance has its root meaning in lack of perspective. So meditation is to gain more perspective. It is to bloom more petals on the chakra of a thousand petals. You know, relatedly, uh, I'm reminded of Uh, During a weekend where I met the Dalai Lama and attended a series of talks from him, he said that he met a scientist who asked him a question and this scientist asked the Dalai Lama and said that there are an estimated 6 billion different perceptions around the world, all defying each other. So how can we know which ones are factual? And the Dalai Lama answered and said that we should strive to come to the ultimate perception of reality. And we do that by questioning and contradicting every viewpoint we have with defying ones in order to come to a more realistic, natural way of knowing. 
And so if we think of every viewpoint as just one part of the infinite blossoming crown chakra, we don't get lost in identifying with any particular one thought, belief or perspective, but integrate it as part of our awareness that holds a bigger picture of reality in mind, impartially in order to maintain a more fundamental or ultimate way of looking at reality. In other words, connecting us to the oneness of reality. Understanding that you are connected to that unified reality here and now, and not hypnotised or swayed by the apparent sub-realities everywhere else. And eventually, through cultivating these higher perspectives of consciousness, we inherently understand that any particular belief or perspective which can be described with words is not reflective of the direct experience of ultimate reality. But that in order to experience ultimate reality, we have to be more grounded in a way of being that is much more respective of that ultimate reality and which is much more subtle and beyond the realms of logical cognition, beyond the realms of intellectual conceptualizations. And this all starts to make sense because we recognize our mind's tendency to seek comfort in conceptualizations and beliefs and predispositions. We understand that the ego wants to grip tightly to mere ideas so that it can feel some kind of safety in the face of this subconscious fear that it has about what it truly does not know deep down. Once we recognize this in a very direct way, we make the decision to let go of that fear and we begin to let our spirit roam free into the great unknown, clinging to nothing and letting ourselves be swallowed up by nothingness itself, the great emptiness or voidness itself, which is called sunyata in Buddhism. So to rest in this becomes very natural because we realise that all our inner chatter and beliefs and struggles and dramas are all deeply dissatisfying, draining and doesn't give us any answers to life. And we realise the only real source of spiritual satisfaction is connecting with source itself, which is consciousness. So insight wisdom, understanding, trust, compassion, serenity, bliss, joy, deep inner peace, all come from channeling higher energies that the crown chakra can awaken to. And there's no isolated feelings here either, no loneliness, no disconnectedness. You know, any person, any yogi or practitioner can be completely alone physically and never see another human being, but never actually feels alone because he's in tune with the field of consciousness which is connected to everyone and thus he's also in tune with the connectedness to everything else. He's in tune with the gifts of every moment itself of life and experience itself, in the majesty of the world around him. His life is full to the brim and abundant with everything, from every flavour of food that hits his palate, to the birds that sing outside on the trees outside his house, to the first rays of sunshine in the morning. Everything is pervaded as God itself in its full majesty, life becomes a constant, blissful, ecstatic, sexually flourishing act that grows deeper and deeper into cosmic realms of knowledge and art. This is the more elevated 
way of understanding Tantra when sex is no longer just applied to the physical act but has been applied to every act in every other aspect of life. This can be related to the fountain of water coming out of Shiva's head, symbolizing that he is in a constant ecstasy. His fountain of life, his spiritual waters, has endowed him with bliss, love and happiness. So with this tantric understanding, we can understand that it's the crown chakra which ultimately helps us control our emotions and deeper primal energies, and that it shouldn't be the other way around. So our emotions, which includes sex as well and all the deepest, deeper emotions of the psyche, should not control our brain. When they control our brain, that's when we become sort of, you know... Uh, like zombies, animalistic and, and angry and all sorts of chaotic emotions, right? The brain, the mental, or should I say the superior mental aspects, the superior mental faculties of the mind and of the brain, the conscious faculties of the mental part should control emotions and primal animalistic forces. Right now, it's generally the other way around, inverted. Sex and emotional impulses are controlling the brain, telling it what to do, even if the brain doesn't want it to do that, and that's why we suffer. That's why we have inner conflict. The pineal gland is the throne of the soul, and it is the throne, it is the king within where we, or queen within, where we are supposed to sit and rule our entire system as a loving and very noble and effective king or queen. You know, all of these lower survival processes are trapping the brain to its will. You know, let's briefly and vaguely connect each chakra to the brain in this sense, right? The root chakra controls the brain and tells it to fear the news and worldly affairs and to be scared about current times and believe it is a dangerous place to live and be very distrustful of everyone. Then the sacral chakra tells us to be even more emotionally disturbed about it or ignore it by indulging through sense pleasures and form addictions, especially sexual addictions. Then we have the solar plexus trying to control the brain, telling us to believe we are a certain way, indulging in certain egoic self-centered aspects about ourselves in order to like ignore the world or, sh or show the world it's better than the world and behave in ways that perpetuate the way we believe ourselves to be. And then we have the heart, throat and third eye all being filtered and controlled by the ego, making us feel a certain way in the heart, whether it's sadness, whether it's jealousy, etc., making us hear false interpretations of the world through the throat chakra, making us perhaps believe or think that certain people are talking badly of us or that we hear interpretations of other people and we, we hate other people and we believe them to be demons, so therefore we hate them or something, and also making us see reality in the third eye in a certain way, in the sense that reality and life is this horrible place to live, that, oh, I don't want to come back to life, earth is a prison, and it's, and it's a horrible place to live, and don't you just hate the world, don't you just hate society, it's so disgusting, it's so demonic, all of that, you know, negative way of seeing the world. Of course, I, you know, have expressed those kind of things, some of those things to be certain truths of reality, but as I've been explaining, it's only one aspect of reality, only one petal on the lotus of the crown chakra that makes up this higher perspective of understanding. You know, don't think that I'm just being contradictory on purpose. I've been pointing out the perspectives that most of humanity is imprisoned in, in order for you to become conscious of that, to become conscious of the way that our lower chakras are wrongly wired to control the higher chakras, okay? 
And so, as I said, they make us see reality in a certain way. And all of this gives our total sense of reality in the third eye and crown chakra a totally damaged energy that desperately needs healing. It desperately needs a totally radical revolution of its energetic state, a totally radical revolution of inverting it, tipping the cycle the other way round so that our higher chakras govern the lower chakras. And so, of course, in order to achieve that radical revolution, we need death, internal destruction of all that unnecessary garbage of the lower chakras, and to understand how it's controlling us and our reality. And so when we aspire for that healing through spiritual practice, yoga, prayer, meditation, reading, contemplating, understanding and comprehending wisdom, higher wisdom, we are calling upon higher forces of the cosmos to bring about a radical revolution of our energy downwards through the crown and to revolutionize and dominate the chakras below. Higher energies descend into us, not fall, but descends into matter. And with this divine knowledge, we set new laws, new internal laws to overwrite the previous lower laws and set about a complete change in our system. In other words, we overwrite our karma. When an inferior law is transcended by a superior law, the superior law washes away the inferior law. I'll put some resources, as usual in this series, uh, to try and understand, you know, karma in this sense. So, the pure idea of raising kundalini from below isn't reflective of a complete understanding of how to awaken kundalini. Because if we begin from below, it can mean we're taking all of our animalistic desires and pulling them up into our higher regions. This is wrong. This is a sort of inverted energy work. Do you really want to pull energies? Do you want to visualize and, and pull energies up the spine from your lower animalistic centers and put them in the brain? Well, lower behaviors are going to manifest, right? We don't want that. But let me clarify, of course, because kundalini does rise, right? You know, kundalini does rise up the spine, but we don't force it. There's no need to sort of visualize or control or force it upwards. So when purifying the chakras, which is what we need to focus on, it is better first to begin with the crown chakra. Not absolutely necessary, of course, but it's more ideal. So, of course, most of you have been working on the root chakra, and that's absolutely fine. But now you'll be able to see the difference, the efficiency, when you begin with the crown chakra. You know, the reason why we go to sleep at night, why the body goes into this kind of comatose state every night, is because it wants to heal itself. Every night, consciousness sorts of switches off or dislocates from the physical body. That's why we don't remember anything during sleep. That has to take place because we are full of ego, and ego damages the physical body. And so every single night, once the ego is out of the physical body, the physical body naturally heals itself. So in the same sense, all we have to do is heal, purify, and cleanse our chakras, and kundalini will rise naturally. The body heals itself naturally when we remove the obstacles, when we remove the source of the problems of the ego and of all the imbalances. So this is quite important now to understand as we move on to the practices when working with all of the chakras. So yes, let me repeat and elaborate a little. When cleansing the chakras, we go from, we start from the crown chakra and then go down because each one governs the one below, ultimately. You see, let's flip around what happens 
when the top chakras control the lower. The crown chakra receives divine universal wisdom and teaches the third eye what and how to see reality, how to discern it correctly and properly. Then the third eye is able to work with the throat chakra in order to hear and express and communicate the truth, which it sees so clearly through the third eye. This all naturally heals the heart center, aligning it with divinity and higher consciousness, and all of those higher chakras are able to fully control the ego in the solar plexus and tell it what to do, fully controlling the impulses and the emotions of the sacral chakra and completely making the root chakra efficient and not getting lost in physical reality. So this is the correct way and the correct direction to purify the chakras, which is really powerful to allow Mother Kundalini to make its natural way up into the system. It is the knowledge and force from the Father above which penetrates wisdom into the chakras downwards and paves the way for the Mother to rise up the spine. This is where worship comes in. This is where devotion comes in. Simply through the act of love and not through controlling do energies start to activate within us. So remember, we don't control the feminine aspect. You know, any look at any uh, couple in the world where the man is controlling the woman very, um, you know, like a tyrant, uh, they're usually not in a happy relationship. You know, the man just loves her and, and lets her be and, you know, gives her this sense of uh, security in the world and provides her with everything. And she just flourishes naturally. She's just happy naturally. We don't have to control or dictate what she does, right? So we can't force Kundalini and move it with our mind at all. Some people think that they can visualize some kind of serpent energy to go up the spine and activate kundalini, but it doesn't work like that. And it's sort of connected to, you know, why some people say uh, kundalini energy work is dangerous. Well, in a way, it could be, especially if you're trying to force some kind of lower energies into your mind. You're trying to, you know, manifest demons into your brain unconsciously. So that's not the way. The process is more of a coaxing from above, from the higher chakras, especially the crown chakra. We coax the energy and ask it sweetly to come to us. Just like how snake charmers use a flute to raise the cobra upwards so it dances. It's just like how a man talks sweetly to the woman he loves to convince her to marry him. We use the masculine aspect to shine cosmic light down through our crown and purify ourselves internally so that the serpent energy can see through the darkness and gently rise upwards in a secure and comfortable way because we provided it with the path, with the light. That's why the Heavenly Father said, let there be light that light which descends down into the third eye, into our material existence, into our material body and goes onwards, making us conscious of our reality and burning our impurities to ashes. And so with that, let me give you the vowel for this chakra. It is, or it sounds like, e. <laughs> so yes, it is the same as the third eye chakra. The pineal gland and the pituitary glands have the same vowel, have the same sound that vibrate together, which you may have seen in the latest guided meditation that I released this week. Uh, that is actually really for the third eye and the crown chakra, which you can understand a lot more now that you've seen this episode. So, let me give you the proper way to work with all of the chakras in one sitting. This is the 
most superior, supreme way that is taught in the Gnostic teachings and that I've been using for many years. And it's just such a wonderful practice to, to cleanse the body. So as we've been seeing, we chant from the top down, chanting one vowel at a time, starting at the crown, then going to the third eye, and then the throat, the heart, the solar plexus. Then we also do the chakra at the lungs to connect us to a cash. Then we go to the sacral and then finally the root. And we just carry on again at the crown and go down again, again, again. And, you know, for as long as you like. And sort of, you know, you can be mindful that uh, once we do the s sound at the root, that transmutes the primal life force energy and stimulates the energy down there and essentially tells Kundalini, it's okay, you can come out from your slumber. I'm sorry that I've kept you asleep for so long. I wish to know the mysteries of the universe. I wish to be healed. Please rise and endow me with spiritual vigor and knowledge. So the s sound activates the serpent's energy at the base of the spine or at the gonads. But this is most effective when we first activate and stimulate the chakras from above. And so once we get to that root chakra, it naturally rises according to our level of purification. And we just continue devoted to the inner work as we've seen throughout this series, and repeat the cycle starting back at the crown again. So, let me demonstrate. I will do one cycle and just basically imagine that we simply repeat this cycle during meditation. We can do this daily and make great progress. It's very powerful. And I will do a guided meditation for this as well. So, here it is. Keeping in mind that we only need to do E once because it vibrates the crown and the third eye at the same time. You can, if you like, do one E sound for the crown chakra and then do it again for the third eye. If you like, you can do that. But I will just do it once. E. And repeat, starting again with E. So just to clarify, perhaps for people who haven't watched the previous episodes, E is for the crown and the third eye. Air is to vibrate the throat. O is for the heart. U is for the solar plexus. R is for the lungs. M is for the sacral and S is for the root chakra. So I know a lot of you asked 
how to work with each chakra, how long you should commit to each one, well, this is the most effective way because as we've seen throughout the series, the chakra energy system is really symbiotic as a whole system. And we should start with the crown and cleanse and stimulate them all like having a spiritual cosmic shower. And you can devote perhaps, you know, depending on your personal abilities, you can commit five minutes a day, ten minutes a day, totally up to you, okay? Now there's another mantra related to this crown chakra, which is the mantra OM or OM. You know, it's usually uh, said OM, OM, but actually the original or proper way or the phonetical way to say it is A-U-M or A-O-M because uh, that's the way the mouth needs to say it, usually. It's okay if you just say OM, but it's better to say AOM because, you know, um, AOM really is symbolic of enveloping the mouth and its ability to create every vowel in the sense that the mouth, when the mouth is wide open with A and then is rounded to O or U and then closed with M, it's, uh, you know, reflective of the mouth's ability to do all the sort of vowels almost. So, like this. Ah. You don't need to stress about completely rounding it up. It's okay if it does come out as just OM. That is absolutely fine too. So in this sense, A engenders everything and O gestates everything. And then everything is born with Mm. So it's a very universal mantra. What This is why it's connected to the crown chakra. This Om Mantra represents the primordial abstract, the absolute space that is beyond attributes or forms or concepts. And yet it is the origin of everything. It is the origin of all form. So it refers to Atman and Brahman the ultimate reality, the entirety of the universe, the supreme spirit, the internal God that lies within each one of us. I'm sure many of you know by now, God is something that is accessed within, not something above the clouds, right? Now, just to give a few extra mentions about the crown chakra to finish off, uh, which are sort of wise to keep in mind, you know, just a few extra tips. You know, a lot of people in spirituality believe that on awakening kundalini, it instantaneously rises to the head and the yogi is automatically united with his innermost or internal god instantly and converted instantly into an ascended master. Wouldn't that be such a nice thought? Uh, some people think like this though. This is a very comfortable way of thinking but not reflective of what really happens on the path. You see there are and we can go uh, into this more after this series on the channel. There are Seven bodies of the being, of our being. You know, when you sit in meditation and you feel your being and it deepens throughout the years, these are the bodies you are connecting to. So there are seven bodies of the being. Each body has its own cerebrospinal nervous system, its own medulla and its own kundalini. Each body is a complete organism in each respective dimension it resides in. So there are, therefore, seven bodies, seven medullas, and seven kundalinis, and this is why we raise seven serpents. Therefore, once the physical body's kundalini is raised, then the etheric body kundalini 
should also be worked to be raised. Then the astral body kundalini raises. Then the mental body kundalini raises. Then the causal body kundalini raises. The buddhic body kundalini raises. And then finally the atmic body kundalini raises. And even then, there are greater journeys for such masters to walk upon, to continue towards. This is related to the study of the three mountains. To walk upon the first mountain is a great work in itself. But of course, you know, that is for another video as well. So I'm just trying to emphasize that never think you've reached some kind of end goal. Okay. And I think that's just an important thing to say, especially now that we've come to the last chakra. And uh, another little tip is also Again, as I've said this in uh, the solar plexus episode, I think it was, you know, get sunlight and see how I explained how the pineal gland is affected by sunlight and melatonin in the video called Remove Blue Light to Astral Project. You know, we have to get sunlight because this ultraviolet light from the sun helps to vibrate the pineal gland and helps us to see our reality in a new light. You know, the sun is responsible for everything we eat, for the life on our earth, and it's also responsible for our evolutionary processes. As the solar system advances and the sun advances, so too is there new energies each day in the sun which affect our DNA. New solar atoms which help us on this spiritual journey of spiritual evolution towards developing and creating our astral body, our mental body, in a permanent way, a permanent center of gravity, okay? And another kind of tip I want to share, uh, it's a sort of five divine rules for the crown chakra. It's a sort of way taught in the Gnostic teachings about how we should best approach life in order to gain the best possible results of activating this crown chakra and kundalini. These five rules are things that we must deny and release from the self. Okay, these five following things. Number one, human or worldly passions, distractions and the many vices of the world. Number two, vain and useless things that don't have a spiritual purpose in your life in any way. Three, attachment to hidden powers. If you have such powers in abundance, act humbly as if you do not have them. Number four, release yourself from your own self. Convince yourself that even though your internal God is very exalted and grandiose, you are nothing else but a shadow of your God. A mere shadow that should be annihilated. Never let pride take control. Never take credit for your spiritual advancement. Give thanks to your internal God. Number five, resolve yourself to die. Do not aspire to exalt your psychological I. Resolve to psychologically die completely every day. You are nothing more than a poor shadow of consciousness, temporarily manifested in this insignificant physical life. Thus, this is how you will be blissfully intoxicated and lost within your internal God dwelling within your soul. This is how you will come to a union with your God within. So these are things that which are to be meditated on, to be fully understood. And since these are about letting go of life and psychological death and surrendering ourselves to a higher way of being above worldly matters, uh, fasting is also great for this chakra, especially in terms of releasing the attachment of the body in order to experience the divine. So whether you practice intermittent fasting 
or and perhaps you even do Ramadan or, you know, perhaps you just do one, two or three days of fasting. Perhaps you just do a water fast, any kind of fast where you control this, uh, you know, desire to eat can be really, really purifying and, and really just powerfully transformative. Anyone who's fasted knows, you know, whether they're spiritual or not, knows it is a spiritual practice or it forces you into spiritual practice because you have to, you are forced to control your animalistic impulses. And if you can control them in a deep way, such as controlling the food you eat, uh, you can control a lot of the rest of the system. So I'll try and leave some resources to do with fasting. Um, maybe I can make some videos on it in the future, uh, but I'm sure some of you already know about it already. Uh, feel free to share with others about fasting. There's also another very powerful mantra. It's essentially known as the most powerful mantra there is, especially in terms of reaching the most ultimate perception of reality. Uh, I love it very much. I'm probably going to devote a whole video in itself. Uh, I'll also be doing a live public Q&A on this channel in a couple of weeks, so you'll all get a chance to ask your questions. I'm sure it will last for quite a while because there are a lot of people with a lot of questions so i will do my best to answer them for you on that session uh, i'll let you know more about the details and the, the date and time on the next episode but if you'd like to ask questions earlier and in a more intimate way feel free to join our astral doorway discord group we had a four hour q a the other day with a lot of great questions from just a really great bunch of people in the group uh, lots of new people who have joined um, anyone is free to join simply visit patreon.com forward slash astral doorway it only costs a few dollars because you know i don't believe in uh, charging you know big amounts for this kind of knowledge i think it's a sort of crime against humanity so yes uh, thank you to the following for joining this week jared pinar louis ash Braden. Parker, Autumn, Jordan, Kyla, Dama, Hannah, Bruno, Matthew, Jane, Tobias, Alesk, Lindsay, Martin, Infilup, James, Daniel, Denise, Adam, Max, and Timothy. Thank you everyone, be sure to be subscribed, click the bell notification button so you know when the next video comes out and also when I go live, and I will see you on the next episode.